Good morning, today we are going to be diving into this book because I've heard so many great things about it. We're just going to read, study, and chat about it together. So if you have some work that you need to get done, something you need to do, your own professional development, or even if you have this book, grab a coffee, get cozy, because we're diving in. Here's the book, Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, Grades K through 12. This interested me because I am curious what tips that he's giving that kindergarten through 12th grade teachers can implement. 14 teaching practices for enhancing learning. She is thick. We're not gonna get through the entire thing today, but just wanted to get started with you guys. We have a forward, acknowledgements, introduction. I'm gonna read this with you guys. Research says, in education, this phrase is often followed by claims about what works in teaching and learning. I regularly find myself responding with clarifying questions. What do you mean by research? How is the study designed? How is success defined? Success for whom? Under what conditions? What do you mean by effective? Peter Liljedal's work is the research that I can't get enough of. Research means exploring important, testable questions with more than 400 teachers and their thousands of students over 15 years. Success this means getting more of these students thinking in math class for longer amounts of time. Effective describes teaching decisions and practices that create conditions for student thinking and results are measured by watching what students do. I want to start highlighting already. Okay, I have green, blue, yellow, and pink. Yellow I want to use just for general highlights and then we'll figure out what the rest of these will be later. How much of an impact does the timing of the launch within the lesson have? While well, students work on the task, should they use notebooks, chart paper, or erasable surfaces in groups or individually? If they're in a group, should everyone have a marker or just one student? What's the optimal group size? How should these groups be formed? How frequently should they change? These are just a few of the hundreds of questions Lil and his colleagues considered and tested through tens of thousands of hours of classroom experimentation to figure out what works and what matters. When they discovered a technique that yielded a significant benefit during a two-week trial as measured by increased student engagement and thinking, they collaborated with teachers to refine the technique over several weeks and then tested the results with many individual teachers. Honestly, I'm already intrigued because these are all questions that I feel like I've gone my whole teaching career kind of bouncing back and forth on whether or not I know the answer. And before even diving into this book, just want to reflect on my own teaching and what I think is best for kids and how much that is constantly fluctuating in math. It's constantly changing and evolving and in my head, when I'm in a lesson or when I'm planning, I'm always trying to do, of course I have the best intentions, but I'm always trying to do what's best for my students in the moment. And I end up changing a lot of things a lot of the time. So I'm really interested in these questions and to see if there is some conclusion when they studied this. Lil Jadal has identified the most effective changes we can make to get our students thinking and keep them thinking longer. I think I'm gonna use blue for things that I resonate with.
Why does it matter? Because most of our students do an awful lot of studenting, but not much thinking. I love that. <laughs> They're doing a whole lot of studenting and not a lot of thinking. The foreword certainly has me intrigued. Everywhere I went, I saw the same thing. Students not thinking and teachers planning their teaching on the assumption that students either couldn't or wouldn't think. He said, like Jane, these 40 teachers were all caught in the same sort of endless and vicious non-thinking cycle. They had students who weren't thinking and they had content to get through. And like Jane, they were using resources and textbooks that were designed to facilitate this. This is not a Jane problem or a Jane school problem. This is a systematic problem. That to me is an interesting concept to build a book around. And I'm interested to hear more about how he explains what he sees when students are thinking versus when students are not thinking. The next header says students not thinking and I'm just wondering like how how can you tell that students are not thinking besides the fact that they might not be engaged, you know? If however you want a bit more of a description of what I mean by not thinking, read on. I would like a description. That's exactly what I was wondering. What I really had was a sense that students were not thinking. I didn't have a good way to either qualify or quantify what I was seeing and not seeing. It was only a sense. It turned out to be true, but at the time it was only a sense. Studenting is what students do in a learning setting, some of which is learning and much of which is not. For me, studenting was the perfect way to start thinking about what it is that students are doing if they are not thinking. When I asked teachers to tell me what student behavior they expect to see during moments, the answers were always the same. I expect to see my students to try to see if they can do it and learn from their mistakes. We expect students to try it and learn from it. Maybe read for data. This part is interesting. He says, in a one hour lesson, 75% to 85% of the students exhibited non-thinking behaviors for 100% of the time. The rest of the students exhibited non-thinking behaviors for all but eight to 12 minutes of the time. Now he does say these are non-thinking behaviors, uh, but that is, those feel like really um, intimidating numbers.
The goal today is to get through the first three chapters or the first toolkit, as he calls it. <clears throat> oh my. Okay, this is all chapter one. In the very beginning of the first chapter, he talks about problem solving um, and he's describing what I am rephrasing as productive struggle. Um, he says students will think and get unstuck. It's not following a formula. It's the thought process the student is having while they attempt to solve a new problem. I am also color coding my notes in the same way that I'm color coding the book. I'm putting page numbers in case I want to go back and reference.
This trick is called true or false, and it starts with three piles of three. And I ask my assistant to pick up one of the piles and look at the bottom card. Show the camera, yeah. Okay, and then we're gonna put that pile on top here. Now, you can lie. Diamond. D-I-A-M-O-N-D-S. Okay, so you're telling me it's a nine of diamonds. Now you have to tell me if that is, if it is the truth or if it's false, but you can lie about that too. Nice. <laughs> okay. Mm. I love these vocabulary terms that he's using. Low floor, high ceiling, open middle. Do you know what those are? Pop quiz. I've never heard them used in this context. He's describing how word problems are called word problems because students have to decode what's being asked. 
versus rich tasks that even after students know what to do, there's still a lot of mathematical, mathematical thinking and processes involved. Rich tasks get students to think at the expense of meeting curriculum goals. Word problems more predictably and reliably push students to use specific bits of learned knowledge, but often at the expense of engagement in the thinking that we need to foster in our students. So how do we move forward? I definitely see this in math curriculum that I've experienced and everything is very confined in my head i believe it to be because they want to be able to assess and we need to be able to assess a certain skill set i guess i'm just interested to hear in the balance of it all One way forward, although seemingly unrealistic, is to stop worrying about curriculum. Not every teacher has the freedom to do that, but let's see what he says. Curriculum tasks are often what students do when they know what to do, after they've been shown how. Turns out that almost any curriculum tasks can be turned from a mimicking task to a thinking task by, so by following the same formulation. Begin by asking a question that is a review of prior knowledge, then ask a question that is an extension of prior knowledge. So the example he gives is, um, like in a primary classroom, have students count to 20. The way that he's extending that and making it more of a rich task. Okay, if we start at 14, what three numbers come after? What three numbers come before? Mm. Mimicking allows students to be successful in the short term. Getting a little lost here. He's saying to use non-curricular tasks, highly engaging thinking tasks, as a primer for scripted curriculum. In order to get students thinking about curriculum tasks, they need to first be primed to do so using non-curricular tasks. Nothing in my research has shown a way to avoid this. You have to go slow to go fast. What does that look like? <laughs> in chapter nine, I'll discuss how to build a sequence of scripted curricular thinking tasks. For now, however, it is sufficient to say that the goal of this book is not to get students to think about engaging non-curricular tasks day in and day out. That turns out to be rather easy. Rather, the goal is to get more of your students thinking and thinking for longer periods of time. So in this section, he's talking about the three different types of lessons, non-curricular tasks, scripted curricular tasks, as is curricular tasks, and it's more of like an info dump versus like here's a bunch of examples. So. It's all just kind of processing right now.
there are discussion sort of questions here at the end. Um, first one is, what are some of the things in this chapter that immediately feel correct? Um, for me, the way he talked about problem solving, that felt right. All the talk about mimicking, which what I'm trying to process right now is the fact that students in the primary grades are very much, you know, learning the basics and not to say that you cannot extend the basics because you can and I have. It seems also important to acknowledge that those basics get better with repetition and repetition is very inherently formulaic. So I think that's where I am wanting to learn more. In this chapter, you read about the negative consequences of mimicking. Can you think of any positive benefits? If so, do these, do these positive benefits outweigh the negative consequences? Which, like I just said, I think that when students are building that foundation, the repetition of just simple, like this is how you add, this is how you subtract, those seem like they yield positive benefits, but especially when you are thinking about it in terms of a curriculum question, we see a lot of times our students are able to answer the question, able to answer the question, and then we get to testing at the end of the year and the question might be a little bit different and suddenly they're stumped. So I do think it's important to get kids, we say thinking outside of the box and trying to find new ways to solve problems. A big component to my lessons is students sharing different strategies, discussing with peers. Um, and I could see how that is helpful for this, in this context. The introduction mentioned that almost all students who mimic express that they thought this is what they were meant to be doing. That makes sense to me. This chapter shares that one of the ways in which students come to this conclusion is by having their teachers show them how to do something before asking them to try it on their own. What other ways may we be communicating that mimicking is what we want students to do, even if that's not what we want? So just a little bit of personal reflection. I feel like I do a little bit of both. Like I can actively think of examples where I've let students try something before we've even begun. And that's more for me to know, okay, who is my target audience that needs this information before I, you know, give it to every single kid who maybe doesn't need it. But I've also begun by modeling before how to do something and then doing it, which I don't necessarily know that there is a, a, a true meaningful place for in math. <laughs> what other ways may we be communicating that mimicking is what we want students to do? I think what my thoughts keep returning to is just thinking about curriculum in general. And for me, I don't have experience with curriculum outside of kindergarten and first grade, but in kindergarten and first grade though, they do introduce strategies. A lot of times they'll introduce strategies one at a time, um, and then they'll test on each individual strategy. So I think that might be one way that we could be communicating that mimicking is what we want because we're saying, okay, we're doing this strategy let's try it, test it. We're doing this strategy, let's try it, test it. You've read in this chapter that curriculum is inherently spiraled and therefore there are very few examples where you would want to introduce a topic for which students have no prior knowledge. Can you think of some examples of situations in your curriculum? If you can, is there really no prior knowledge that can be drawn on? I don't think so. In this chapter, it was shown that students perform better on scripted curricular tasks if they have first experienced three to five classes of working on highly engaging non-curricular tasks. How do you feel about giving up this time? What are the barriers for you to do this? What do you stand to gain? What do you stand to lose? So one of the macro moves in this chapter is starting every lesson with a thinking task and having a certain amount of lessons that are those highly engaging sort of critical thinking tasks before you get into the curriculum. For me, I'm not as concerned about time to get to an end goal. I'm still of the belief that that end goal is different for every child. So that time factor isn't as important to me. The thing that I'm still trying to think about more is the curriculum wants you at least in kinder first grade, the curriculum wants you to pose things a certain way and do things a certain way. I know not a lot of teachers actually can stray 
from that curriculum. I don't know if it's more rigid in elementary school and middle school than it probably is in high school, but if we do those super engaging critical thinking tasks and then move into the curriculum, it almost seems like a lot of the curriculum would be skipped over anyway. And on that note, it also gets me thinking the way that I typically have done like room transformations and things in the past is we do all of the hard work up front. And then at the end, they take what they've learned and apply it to what I would consider to be a highly engaging critical thinking task. But this kind of sounds like the opposite model of that. If I'm thinking about this correctly, I guess it wouldn't have to be, these highly engaging tasks don't necessarily have to be room transformations. I'm just thinking of it in terms of my own experience, but what are some of the challenges you anticipate you will experience in implementing the strategies in this chapter? What are some of the ways you can overcome these? I'm sure he's gonna give many more examples on how to do this. Uh, for me personally, whenever I'm learning something new, I need lots of examples. Um, so the main kind of structure that he is suggesting is leading with a question that draws upon their prior knowledge, which they have, and then extending that question. And then the final step would be a totally new question that requires them to think a different way. That last part is the trickiest part for me, that third step, a new question that requires them to think in a different way. The example that he used with counting to 20 okay, they're gonna use their prior knowledge to count together to 20. And then the way he changed that and extended it was he said, what are three numbers that come after 14? And what are three numbers that come before 14? But then how do you, how do you take that and turn it into something new? How different does it have to be? Could it be as simple as, all right, what if we started at five? What if we started at 18? Is that different? enough to have an effect. That's where I'm struggling. All right, chapter two.
All right, so far in chapter two, I have learned that according to his research for the grade range that I teach, K through two, the ideal grouping is two students. Um, he says at this point in their development, and because they do a lot of turn taking, it's a more natural grouping, I guess, for them. Versus grades three and up, the ideal grouping is three. He goes into detail about that, but he also says, this is why self-selected groups tend not to be as productive. There's too much redundancy and not enough diversity. So the students are too similar to each other, usually if they're self-selecting their group, which is also interesting because, for example, let's say you are teaching a lesson and you have already determined at the beginning of the lesson by asking your critical thinking question, let's say you can pinpoint which students already know how to get to the answer. The redundancy and diversity makes me think about how oftentimes, myself included, teachers will group together the high kids, they'll group them together and have them go off and work on something, which would be redundancy. Not, I don't necessarily think that's something he says you shouldn't ever do but for me i'm just thinking about like okay what is the balance between redundancy and diversity where you don't just have always one student learning from another student and not in more of a reciprocal process where they're they're both learning something which i think is why we tend to group students who are at the same level together when it comes to math because they can work and problem solve at a different level. He also talks about uh, the best method for grouping is visibly random groupings. Um, so the way that a lot of primary teachers do this is they'll hand out cards like your peanut butter, your jelly, or they'll hand out colors. Um, I like to use Class Dojo and you can, you know, adjust the number of kids in each group. But he said that visibly random groupings were the most successful in his research because over time students were more accepting of that idea. Whereas if the teacher assigned the groups or said, okay, these are your random groups, the students still felt that they weren't truly random and that affected their performance. And he also says that it eliminates social barriers and students are less likely to live up to roles. So it's more like the self-fulfilling prophecy is what it makes me think of. And then something interesting that he talks about is knowledge mobility, which he rephrases down here by saying students call, call it borrowing an idea. And he says that your groups, which ideally are groups of two or three, are basically working on a problem and then they have three options of outside aid before ever coming to you. Um, and the first option is going out to other groups to borrow an idea to bring back to their group. Not necessarily, you know, walking over and saying, oh, the answer is 24. 24, borrowing an idea, and then uh, comparing answers to another group. So going out seeing, okay, do we have the same answer or a different answer? And then groups coming together to debate different solutions, which I think is all very applicable to a first grade classroom. There are absolutely ways you could train this in a kindergarten classroom. Like even if it's something as simple as like, okay, do your answers match? And then comparing your work, you can do that in kindergarten. But I hadn't ever heard that term before, knowledge mobility. Access. Do you ever read a word and think that it doesn't look right? <laughs> I'm trying to synthesize the information and write it down in a different way. And I'm questioning my spelling. I think that's correct.
There are several reasons we may wish to keep students apart from each other. Ironically, regardless of the reason, those students often want to be together. And that will happen when you start randomizing your groups, usually on the first day. So this is a question that I had too. For a long time now, I've been working on differentiating my instruction for my learners. This works best if my students are in ability groupings. How will that work if I start to randomize them? This is something I'm really questioning, especially in a first grade classroom where if for the first semester we're teaching very basic level ideas. So when a student doesn't know something and another student knows you know third grade content how does this work and he said well first he kind of prefaces it by saying there will be more strategies in this book to help combat this and he's this uh what i imagine to be difficult transition for primary teachers to a hundred percent of the time have randomized groupings which i don't want to sound closed-minded but where i stand where i sit right now i don't imagine a classroom where every single time students are working together which i think should be often it's random i obviously i'll have to read more about this and the strategies but it's so ingrained in me to do that some of the time and then to be mindful in the selection some of the time. I could see myself drastically reducing that, but I can't see myself right now 100% of the time doing visibly random groups. It's at the risk of sounding stubborn, I'm just being honest. I'm open to this. I guess, I guess we'll see. He says, all your students will become better at thinking and they'll do so in ways that are not predicted by your current perception of your students' abilities. Some of your strong students will reveal themselves to only be strong at mimicking and will struggle on thinking tasks. This I do see, I fully agree with this. Um, I even see this in spelling, which a lot of times, you know, if you have like a spelling pattern of the week, there are students who are good at mimicking that pattern if you give them a spelling test and then two weeks from now you ask them to spell a word and those students who are so good at mimicking and knowing the pattern that you were doing that week are all of a sudden unsure what to do but this is not some of your weaker students will prove themselves to be much better at thinking than others in the class and the ones in the middle will completely reshuffle your perceived hierarchy i could see that another thing i highlighted was differentiation looks different in a thinking classroom we all start groups on the same task and then differentiate the hints and extensions we give each group depending on how they're doing. And 
That's one of the things that in theory sounds very straightforward and very simple. Everyone has a starting point and then the term he used earlier, high ceiling, you extend, extend, extend. This seems a bit more complicated when you consider the fact, and I'm only in chapter two, but my current thoughts are, and I hope, I hope they're resolved, but my current thoughts are more along the lines of, all right, if I have, we'll say a perfect even number, 24 students, and I have 12 groups of two, I am visibly randomizing these groups. I am, I wrote down two tips he gives for this, which is um, encouraging knowledge mobility between groups. So if a group is struggling or needs to outsource something or get help from someone other than you, you can either point them out or I said strategically localize. <laughs> so putting groups close to each other that you kind of have a feeling might need help. So you're not actively saying you two must work together. You two must work together that's random but if you place those two groups close to each other it's like a little a little lift of support that's great so we're all starting on the same task and then now your job as the teacher depending on how this is run in a in a sense you almost have to monitor in my classroom it would be about 12 different groups of two and how do you go about being sure that each group of two is in the right range for their individual needs. Let's say eight groups need extension. It just seems this is this is the part that's overwhelming because I'm taking the ideas and the theory and trying to imagine what that looks like in my own classroom. So those are the answers that I am hoping to get. Everything he said so far makes a lot of sense. Usually these things do. Usually they do make a lot of sense, but I haven't gotten to the strategies yet. So those are all just my thought processes as I'm going through. A question from the FAQ. Sometimes I like to let students think and work on a task before they go into their groups. Should I still do that with random groups? And he says no. He says less collaboration took place. That, make, that also makes sense to me. Well, I've already talked about some of the challenge that I am anticipating. The things that immediately feel correct are that students will live up to their perceived idea. I've seen that happen so many times. Um, and it also is interesting to see that he said assigning roles actually has a negative effect on groups. Assignment roles like leader, recorder, timekeeper led to less authentic engagement and it was almost like a distraction for students or they would use it as an out. And another just interesting thing he said 
was he talked about students who shouldn't be together. If the situation is one where the students really shouldn't be together, you'll find a way to work around this. However, be certain that it is the case that they really shouldn't be together and not that you perceive or prefer they shouldn't be together. There is a difference. I think a lot of times we will make decisions in order not to sacrifice peace. And a lot of times we can assume based on behaviors that we've seen that certain students working together will fall into a repeated pattern. But if you're doing visibly random groups and you're doing them often and every day, then inevitably those students will be together. He said, <laughs> usually on the first day, inevitably they will be together, but maybe that is an opportunity for them to try again, you know, clean slate. Also, when you are working with elementary age students, you have a parents who are very forward about kids being in a class with their child. You'll have parents directly tell you you do not want them to be near each other. You'll also have students who have IEPs and accommodations. So all that needs to be taken into account as well. It is very interesting so far. I, I'm definitely not into the nitty gritty. We are at chapter three. I think I've been, oh, I've actually spent about three hours, <laughs> give or take so far. It's all very interesting so far. Um, the big reason that I even know, there you go. The big reason that I even know Peter Liljedal exists is because I heard about VPNs, wait, VP, not VPN, VNPs, vertical non-permanent surfaces. So he says you can use a chalkboard, a window, whiteboards, or anything that the students can write on in a race. So you can use, um, like at Home Depot, they have, he said it was called shower board, even better than paper, which teachers are familiar with. He says that this has yielded, I feel like you're crooked. He says that this yields the best results when you have students in random groups. So for me, it would be randomly grouping students in groups of two or three and having them work standing on a vertical non-permanent surface. So just imagine your head what that looks like. They, he does have a picture here of what this looks like in, it seems like a high school classroom where they are fortunate enough to have whiteboards all around the room. So take that same visual and now think of 12 groups, possibly 13 groups or more of students around the classroom writing on a vertical non-permanent surface. To me, I am thinking, okay, what surfaces do I even have available with my current setup? I'm not just a math teacher, obviously, I teach everything. But as of right now, wall space is being taken up with things that we're using daily. In addition to student work displays, which I think is important, in addition to storage. So do I have even a space where students can be on the edge of the classroom currently? No. <laughs> I almost wish I could use like the hallway, but that's not possible because it's, it's way too loud. We can't be out there 24 seven. And he did say that if students were standing and writing on whiteboards that were horizontal rather than vertical, the effect was still high. He has a table here. These are the the average scores. So for a vertical whiteboard versus a horizontal whiteboard, time to task less than a second faster on a vertical surface, time to first notation three seconds faster, time on task three more minutes on a vertical surface. They were on task for three minutes longer than a like a whiteboard that'd be horizontal. Eagerness to start less than a second difference amount of discussion less than a second difference, amount of participating less than a second difference, amount of persistence same, amount of knowledge mobility. Wait, this isn't a second, is it? What is this? These aren't seconds, is it? I don't know what the unit is on some of these. So the differences are marginal with the biggest difference being time on task. I would love to implement the vertical surfaces. I think you could also 
with like individual student whiteboards or like even the the large ones he's talking about the whiteboards by wipe books you could you could do some kind of like easel situation this is where i'd love your help if you have any help or suggestions because i think the easiest way for me to start implementing it right away is doing the horizontal work surface i almost wish i've seen in classrooms before um like i think fancy nancy and fifth she has tables in her classroom that easily flip like the work surface of the table will be will flip up i don't know if it's for storage or movement or what but like that would be really cool to have like if you had tables that could just easily convert up that would be awesome <laughs> okay solution the solution is to buy new tables no this is this is interesting though um, and it is like the first like physical strategy or move that he's mentioned. If we're only giving each group one marker, ooh, I missed that. Where did he? Proximity of groups has a big impact on how well knowledge moves between groups. Likewise, using vertical whiteboards is enhanced by each group having only one marker. I glazed right over that. If we're only giving each group one marker, how do I ensure everyone is contributing? You move the marker around. This can be done using varying degrees of subtlety. He says you can go and visit a group, borrow the marker, and hand it back to a different person. Less subtle is asking the group. Who hasn't held the marker yet and giving it to them? Even less subtle is setting a timer that's loud enough and telling them every time the timer goes off, they must pass the marker. Those are really good ideas. It also says you can come up with a rule that whoever is holding the marker is not allowed to write any of their own ideas, which can be helpful for students who might be self-conscious that they have nothing to share, especially if you do the method where when this timer goes off, marker switches hands. I. I find this section really, really helpful. Once you get students thinking in random groups and on vertical surfaces, the playing field is sufficiently altered to allow new abilities to emerge. Every teacher who has done this has come to the realization that some of who they thought were their best students were actually quite weak at thinking tasks. And he's suggesting that one, one surface per group. It's hard to just envision having vertical, non -per vertical non-permanent surfaces up on every, like that's like every single bit of my classroom, which I don't think is feasible in a way that I'm imagining right now. But whiteboards, that's that's easy enough. It's hard when you wanna do all the things.
Okay, I finished chapter three, which means that I have read toolkit number one, chapters one, two, and three. I did peek a little bit at chapter nine just because he references it quite often, but I think overall I'm really excited to keep exploring this book. If you are interested in it as well, I will leave a link down below. Like I've said, I've heard really, really great things so far. I know these first three chapters, he is just setting the foundation. He does suggest that you use these first three and continue on, but I'm still, there's still a bit of ambiguity with the first, at least the first chapter and really I guess just the first chapter the types of tasks um, and the reason that one seems more intimidating to me is just because I'm wondering how quickly I will be able to do this in practice. I'm the kind of teacher who uses parts of a curriculum and uses parts from other outside resources. And I love getting my kids thinking and asking deeper questions and kind of feeding off of them. But I'm wondering if I am going to be able to in practice model a task or activity in the way that he is describing. <laughs> Does that make sense? So in summary, the goal is to keep students on task and thinking for as much time as possible without mimicking, having enough productive struggle, building communication and social skills, feeling safe to solve problems and try answers using vertical, but at the minimum non-permanent surfaces to facilitate that using proximity to ensure that there is knowledge mobility, randomizing groupings of students, keeping your group numbers small that's so that students don't fall into predetermined roles. What am I missing? That mostly covers it. Um, and then ensuring that your tasks first start out with a question that draws upon their prior knowledge, extending it, and then giving them a question that has something new. I'm still struggling with the task section of this. I do think that this book so far is worth getting. I will keep you guys updated. Be sure to follow me on Instagram. I will probably update you in that form a little bit more often, but I will hopefully be implementing as many of these ideas as possible as we go into the new school year. My goal is to finish the book before the school year starts, we'll see how that goes. But I will say that really taking time to process and think through a lot of the things that he is speaking about definitely helped me understand it more and getting to kind of sit here and talk it out with you probably helped me dig a little bit deeper than if I was just silently reading through this book in my head with the idea to just get the information from the book. So if you are able to do this with another teacher or your school or a book club of some sort, I would definitely recommend that. Thank you for being here. I hope it helped you be a little bit more productive. And if anything, I hope it got you at least interested in this book if you are also a teacher. Like this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe and join the family down below, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.